Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's webinar from Spec Innovations, What is the Lifecycle Modeling Language? My name is Sarah Craig, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. Let's go over some quick housekeeping before we get started. For those of you who may not be aware, Spec Innovations provides systems engineering services and solutions to the aerospace, defense, and intelligence communities. Our flagship software, InnoSlate, provides users with an all-in-one systems engineering software solution with requirements management, analytics, modeling, simulation, and analysis of alternative tools. We help organizations securely collaborate on critical projects throughout the product or systems lifecycle. During the presentation, feel free to send us questions using the panel on the right, and we will get them answered in the question and answer part of the webinar. The webinar is being recorded and we will make it available to you after the live presentation, so be sure to keep an eye out for it in your inbox. Now, I would like to introduce you to our presenter, Dr. Stephen Dam. Today, he will be covering the lifecycle modeling taxonomy and the LML ontology, as well as helping you get started with implementing and executing LML into your next project. Dr. Dam is the president and founder of Spec Innovations. He has been involved with research experiments, operations analysis, software development, systems engineering, and training for more than 40 years. Dr. Dam participated in the development of C4 ISR architecture framework and DOD architecture framework, DODAF. He has also received an expert systems engineering professional, ESEP, certification from INCOSI. He currently is applying systems engineering techniques to various DOD, DOE, and commercial projects. And now I will hand over the controls to Dr. Dam and we will get started. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so I'm going to go through uh, probably some slides you may, a number of you may have seen before, but uh, I'll go through and spend a little bit of time on them because uh, there's a lot of little things that uh, people don't understand about LML. And uh, I think there's a good opportunity for us to talk about them and, and uh, get into it a little more depth. So uh, what is LML? LML was a, a, a language designed to look at both the ontological elements, the underlying uh, data elements you would want to capture in any kind of system or project, and also have the ability to do the modeling people want to do too. Um, and particularly uh, we, when we compare that to some other languages that are out there, uh, like SysML is, is one that's commonly used in this area. Uh, that's mainly a, it's mainly oriented around the diagrams, the diagramming framework and the diagramming constructs and how those are all done correctly. Um, and it has sort of a limited implied ontology to it, but it's not well defined. Uh, that is a project that is ongoing for SysML 2.0. We understand uh, that's still apparently a year or so away at least. Uh, and so we're still waiting to see what they do there. But it, it, what we found is that uh, with other ontologies like the DM2, the DODAF Metal Model 2.0, which is used for the uh, DoD architecture framework, if you're not familiar with that ontology, very in-depth, uh, very, very, um, uh, it, it's very detailed ontology, it, it, but it's also difficult to, to learn. It's difficult to use. It's, you know, fortunately, most people use it through tools that are more focused, again, on the drawings and diagrams and things like that. So <laughs> that's helpful, but it, it still doesn't quite get you there. Um, we found uh, we could easily map to these with LML, um, these other ontologies, these other, these other languages. Uh, and because what we did, we, we went through and really thought about, well, what does a program manager and system engineer need in terms of this language? And how do we make it simple enough for everybody to be able to understand it? It shouldn't be a, a you know, you don't want a language to be something that's so complicated that only a few people understand it. The purpose of a language is to communicate. <laughs> so. So what we wanted to do was create something that was easy to work with, easy to understand, easy to use, and also something that worked across the full life cycle. So it wasn't focused just on the front end of systems engineering efforts in the beginning of the life cycle, but something that could support all the way through the life cycle. Because 
systems engineering is done all through the life cycle, so it makes no sense, and certainly program management is too, so it's important to have all of that. So the LMO ontology, and for those of you who are not familiar with the big O word, <laughs> it's simply a taxonomy, which is the, how we break things down. You, you, most of us first learn taxonomies in biology, right? You, you saw that the different species and the phylos and all the other stuff that goes with that. I don't even remember all that, but it's it was kind of the, that that first breakdown of things you would see. Um, and we tried to keep that really simple, as simple as we could. So we came up with 12 primary classes, uh, and I will use the word element and entity interchangeably, by the way, um, so you'll, you'll hear that. Uh, and so in that, though, you can make types of a particular class. So for example, the action class is our, is our behavioral or functional class. Uh, it can be a function, it could be an activity, it could be a task, it, but, but we use that one term action to represent all those different ways and start breaking it up. Um, that's important because it turned out that one of the confusing pe things people had was, okay, well, uh, what's the difference between a function and an activity or a task? Well, really it was depending on a definition and perspective of the person. But fundamentally, they're the same kind of object, same kind of information content is, is being captured in. So it made sense to do this and then allow the typing to, to add the distinction between them as you want to. Um, the other part about ontology is the relationships. So e you, the, these, this taxonomy of elements is related to it, each other. And in fact, in, 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 in LML, the classes, in fact, are almost all related to one another. <laughs> sometimes the multiple relationships even possible depending on what you're trying to do and how you're trying to use it um the thing is uh, again that's that gets pretty complicated now okay now you're getting to the complex part um and so with that we decided well, what we wanted to make sure was if we were going to do a verb form going from one in a relationship going from one direction to the other one one element class to another that we'd have if we did the inverse we'd use that same verb form so you see all the way consistently you'll see things like performs and perform by is this example showing you between the physical assets and the actions so that that helps it simplify it a little bit at least and again i i know for consistency purposes if i'm trying to do the reverse traceability i can track that fairly easily uh, another thing we did was say the hierarchy. So let's let's have all the hierarchical relationships be the same. And it doesn't matter what class you're in, you use decompose by and decomposes. Very simple, it's easy to understand, uh, it doesn't get complicated. It, I, it, I, you know, a lot of people try to turn this into simple English sentences. And first of all, not everybody speaks English. <laughs> but secondly, uh, it, 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 this is this is a way to keep it simpler if we if we take that consistency. So if you if you put it into a sentence, you sometimes sound a little stilted, but it's okay. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. <coughs> and then uh, we also wanted to have a peer-to-peer -peer relationship. We wanted to make sure we could show that uh, things are relate, related to each other within the same class. So you think of a case where now I have two documents that are kind of at the same level in your document tree. What's the relationship between those two documents? <coughs> Excuse me, this is to be a way to uh, establish that. Okay, so um, the, the actual taxonomy itself, elements, are here. As I said, there are 12 primary classes, but there are several subclasses we defined in the standard as well, uh, because they were more common terms people were used to, and where we could home basic concepts in program management and systems engineering that people could use. So the action, again, I've already talked a little bit about. That's our functional element. That's that's uh, that's where you would uh, you're going to use that in your functional analysis uh, capabilities. Again, an equivalent in SysML would be called an activity. Uh, that's perfectly fine. Uh, artifact is the is a documentation element. Um, it could be a document, it could be an email, it could be anything else that you want to do to kind of document what you're doing. 
Um, and of course, you know, that that's the hard part about coming up with a good word that's a general word. And so artifacts seem to be a good term and, and it's a common term used uh, in the industry. Uh, the physical element is assets. So those are those are your those are those assets are people, they can be hardware, they can be software. So, yeah, so that's a good way to think about the asset. Um, I had one organization tell me, well, we have a different term that we use asset for. Yeah, yeah, I know that, but <laughs> go with me here. <laughs> um, anyway, so the, the subclass of that that's been defined is called resource. And a resource is something that can be consumed, it can be produced, or it can be seized, in other words, borrowed. Um, so things like, uh, you can think of like memory in a, um, in a computer is a resource. Uh, so that's that's something that that is seized by different processes until it runs out of memory, and then then you can't add another process to it, right? So so again, that, that's how that's used. It's used in conjunction, particularly with the actions themselves, um, and so you'll you'll see that in some of the modeling that we do um, <clears throat> using in this uh, The next class is characteristic. So characteristic is a general kind of attribute of anything. Uh, it could be a, a, an attribute of an asset, a general asset. Uh, one I use, example I use all the time is paint it gray. Uh, if, you, if you work with the Navy, you know that they like paint things gray. <laughs> and of course, that's a specific color of gray that is, that is defined. And so that would be a characteristic of certain components of the system, certain assets in the system. It wouldn't be appropriate for everybody, right? Uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't paint a, a, a person gray. Uh, at least that would be kind of weird if you did, but you, you wouldn't do things like that. So again, this acts sort of as a floating attribute, and that's, that's a way I like to think about it. Um, measure. So measure subclass of characteristic. Now this is where we actually capture metrics. So this has thresholds and objective values and things like that as attributes to it. So this it really makes it easy to, to see the difference and, and turn it into a, a key performance parameter or a, a technical, uh, technical performance measure or those kinds of metrics that you're used to using. <clears throat> uh, the next class uh, is really more of an abstract class. It's a connection. And we have two, two different types we've defined and you can think of other kinds you might want to come up with, by the way. Um, and I have actually come up with a few in the, in, in the past. Uh, but the obvious ones are things like conduit, which is an actual pipe. Uh, something's flowing down the pipe. Uh, that has attributes of uh, latency and capacity. Uh, the logical is a relationship. So if I'm using assets as a way to define different classes of information, uh, and I want to have little classes related to each other, I would use the logical connector, connection, to, to actually uh, make that, that relationship between them, defining that relationship. Uh, another connection example was mechanical. I mean, you think about it, you might have a mechanical joint as a kind of connection or connector that you want to define between things. Uh, so that's the, I know that that's a whole other thing you could easily add there. So again, these 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 aren't meant to be the be all and end all. This is this is this is the basic set. This is the base language. Okay, the next one is cost. So cost is I hope obvious because we're supposed to be optimizing cost schedule and performance or mitigating risk. <clears throat> okay, in each of those areas. So it's important to do that and have that as an independent variable, and we do have that in the language as that purpose. Uh, at the top right here is decision. <clears throat> so you see the decision element, that's where we capture the decisions that are made and the assumptions that are associated with those decisions uh, are captured there as well. Um, that's very useful if you're creating a decision database, which we're supposed to be doing. <laughs> that's what you're trying to use a database for, you're trying to make decisions. And so this is a great way to capture that and capture that information in a place where you can now go back to it because if nothing else we know in projects we work on in this in this these areas we work in there is churn there's changes of people uh, and, and frequently we see that uh, uh, you know happening as often as annually 
um, people will change out. And we, all of a sudden, now I've got new people. They don't know what the decisions were made, why they were made. So documenting those decisions is very helpful for people coming in new, and they can learn at least the why a decision was made, uh, and you can trace it back to what it, what it affects. Um, next one is input-output. That's our data flow. Um, and so that has uh, size attributes to it. Uh, and, and so you can track the size of this 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 thing that no, that that by the way gets transferred by a conduit so it can go down that pipe so they, they work together and you'll, you'll see that relationship in a minute um, location 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 that's another abstract class um, we can uh, inst we've, inst we've suggested instantiations of physical which is really a Cartesian coordinate kind of view uh, of location orbital which has specific orbital parameters and, and characteristics and then virtual which is cyberspace it's primarily urls and things like that it could be position of uh, on a disk of of, an, of something you know a, a, an address disk address be another thing you could use that for uh and then now we get to risk and risk is probabilistic in nature uh, so it's probability and consequence are the attributes associated with it. Uh, this lets you do your risk tracking and statusing. Um, and of course, you can associate risk with any of these other objects, any other classes of information. Uh, next is statement. That's the general contextual information uh, you see out of a document, right? You, you take a document, you start breaking it up into, into paragraphs and into sentences even, and those are nice general statements unless there's specifically a requirement. And the requirement is the subclass, and that has specific quality attributes associated with it to say, is it a good requirement or not? And so that's helpful to, for your doing requirements analysis. And last but definitely not least is time. So time is where we capture schedule, like milestones, when, what are the milestones? So that's how that's used heavily. Okay, so the key is, this really supports capturing information throughout the life cycle. Uh, I, we've been now using this since 2012. Uh, it's been very effective on many programs and we find that we don't have to extend it much, usually, but I'll talk a little bit more about extensions later. Um, so a way to look at these and kind of group this, these classes of information is in terms of models. And everybody loves modeling. Model-based systems engineering is the big vogue term. Um, it's only something we've been doing for ever since I was working. <laughs> but okay, uh, let's come up with a new term. And uh, that's fine. Uh, and so, so we have different models. And, and, and particularly the top one is probably one that you go, well, what? A documentation model. Yes, well, you know, if you think about an artifact, an artifact can be a container of statements and requirements. So that ends up being my, my documentation model. And if I treat them as objects in a database, I can actually create a doc, document view of something uh, based on that information. So, so now, now it's no longer just in a, in a Word document or something like that where it's difficult to get out and trace and do all the things you can need to do. You can have that documentation model. Uh, the other ones you're probably mostly familiar with is the functional model and the physical models. And the primary entities associated with those are the action, input, output for the functional. And, and for the physical model, it's the asset resource and conduit are kind of your physical elements, principle. Um, you can mix them together, by the way, too, so that they come together. They, so they do connect to each other and they all have are related to each other, as you'll see in a minute. At the bottom is our parametric and program model. This is all the information, other information you need to do to kind of capture and define the system and the system and the program to develop the system. Okay, so this is a nice way to kind of group and look at them. Uh, this is sort of like the four pillars of SysML. If you want to make that connection, you could. Uh, there are diagrams that can go with each of these as well. Um, and of course, our different uh, not just diagrams, but forms of, of viewing the information, um, like a, a document, put a documents model. So related relationships. So the primary relationships that we suggest between the different ones, and of course you can adjust these as you want to and as you need to on things, be consistent is the main thing. 
but this is the way that language was designed to work. And so from the artifact, it becomes a source of statements, okay, and requirements. Those are traced to actions, and then actions are performed by assets, and characteristics can specify an asset. That's usually how it's used, but it can, it can also be used to, to specify an action or anything else you want it to do. So again, that, but this is the primary thing. And then the input outputs you see are generated by and received by the actions, whereas the conduit is connected by and connects the assets together. And then that, that input output is transferred by the conduit, okay? Very simple. Um, the the uh, notice the circular errors. That's your decomposition. Again, every class can be decomposable. That's another another tenet of of LML. Uh, that's very helpful because because you want to be able to break things down. That's what we do. We start with a complex problem at the top we can't solve. We break it into pieces so we can solve it. But these relationships are critical so we don't lose the context of the of how that information we've broken apart relates to each other. So it's really important to do that well. Okay, so that was the good news, simple part. This is the hard part. So everybody says, well, well, gee, you know, your 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 language may be too simplistic. Probably not. <laughs> not when you see this chart. This is this is an 11 by 17 in in the actual specification. Uh, but you can see I blew up a, one of the cells, so you could kind of see what's in it a little bit more. Uh, but you've got to get the feeling quickly that almost everything's related to everything else, okay? And the multiple relationships part of that is also part of here. So anyway, this will, this will help you understand that part of it. Now, of course, what adds to the complexity, which I don't talk about here in these slides, but it is in the specification, is attributes. We have attributes on the classes, and we've talked about some of those, like the, uh, the latency and capacity on the conduit. Yet those are attributes on the class of information or the entity of class of information. And then the relationships can also have attributes, okay? And so that, again, gives you that much more depth of the language. And that makes sense. And if you think about it in terms of language, my classes represent nouns, my relationships represent verbs, right? So if I have an attribute on the, the, the class, that's the equivalent of an adjective. If I have an attribute on my relationship, it's the equivalent of an adverb. So again, it, this gives that wealth of the language you're looking for. I haven't figured out how to put in participles yet, but maybe that's, but that's okay. I'm, uh, that may be beyond what I even want to try to do. <laughs> but anyway, so it's, it's uh, something we can talk about. <laughs> maybe, maybe that has a role here. We want to think about it. Um, another thing we said was that, you know, you really need to have diagrams to be able to be associated with it. But the diagrams themselves aren't the, the primary driver. Uh, it's important with the language. Now, again, remember, we've got all these different uh, types, uh, all these different classes of information. So I have 20 classes of information, roughly, including the, the subclasses. <clears throat> I am related to each other. So what are the number of combinations I can have for that? Well, it's something on the order of 20 factorial. Well, that means I, if I was diagramming just two of those items at a time on a graph, I would need a lot of graph types, a lot of diagram types to actually capture all that information. And so think about that number sometime, how big that is. <laughs> it's, it'd be impossible to diagram it way out of this problem. But what we can do, so you can, people are going to have diagrams all they want, and we're happy to do that, but we wanted to have the three basic ones that were critical, that were, had to be consistent. So the action diagram, the asset diagram, the spider diagram, I'm going to go through each one of those in a little more detail. But there's nothing wrong with having other kinds of diagrams, and particularly we recommend using common diagram types that people are comfortable in using all the time. There's no reason to reinvent all these diagram types. You, again, you just can't diagram your way out of this problem by itself. So, uh, okay. um, 
So let's go through the, the main ones. So the action diagram, that's our functional behavior model, um, equivalent to a, 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 it's an enhanced functional block diagram that, uh, that Vitek uses. Uh, it was called a behavior diagram in RDD 100 when I used that tool. Um, so again, it's, it's, it's a fairly common idea. Uh, the, the big difference though in the action diagram is instead of having constructs for the logic elements, we have a special case of the action. And that turns out to be really an important concept because what you want is those, those, uh, those constructs really are decision points. And you wanna make that decision and make that explicit that that's a decision that needs to be made so that then you can track who or what makes that decision. This is where you can build in command and control structures at, at different lower levels. You can build in uh, defense in depth for cybersecurity, uh, things like that. So this, this is a very unique thing. It, you can do that in other languages, but you have to force yourself to remember to put that decision point in there and, and, and as a separate item uh, to, to work with usually. And so this, this makes this a lot more almost as a forcing function of it. We also found that we only needed three really primary types, which is the or, the sync, which is the uh, where you take parallels coming in and you end them. So uh, in, in, uh, in computers, uh, when we do parallel processes, we always have a synchronization point that we bring them back together before we close out the thread. Um, so that's always an important uh, concept to have. Uh, and of course, the last one's the loop, which is an obvious one, I hope. Uh, and again, you notice we don't have a lot of extra clutter in the diagram, so there's not a lot of extra stuff for you to for you to look at. It's the basic block, uh, sometimes a block with a point on it, um, and then uh, with the number and, and a name. So simple, simple, simple. Um, the the IOs we use the old-fashioned uh, data symbol. All right, the parallelogram, uh, and you have green ones and gray ones, you can colorize them, do whatever you want. But basically the idea is that those become your triggers between the actions, and they're passing the information and also can have a control uh, uh, factor to it as well. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, let's see what else I wanna say about this one. Um, one of the important things though is Anybody can draw a drawing. If you can't simulate it, you don't know if it, that it works, okay? So it's very, again, a very, very fundamental idea concept here is that ability to make sure that you can uh, verify that what you're developing and designing works as early in the, in the life cycle as possible. Because as you know, if you're building in errors in your design early in the life cycle, you pay for them big time in the back end when you usually find them, which is, and unfortunately that often happens in terms of operations support, right? Oh, we found a bug <laughs> in the release. <laughs> yeah, that's that's not great. <laughs> um, so the next, so, so let me walk through again, the basic entity uh, is the action entity. Again, the loop construct, input output and resources. Now. The resources was something that we added in InnoSlate uh, to be explicitly on the diagram. I don't believe that was in the original specification, but one of the things we're trying to do is, again, visualize as much information as possible on here. Uh, we also added the idea of a branch asset so that you could do allocation uh, as well in it. So, so there's some, some things we added. We went a little beyond the specification in InnoSlate but we thought those were good ads. And someday maybe we'll come back and, and put those in front of the committee again and see if they wanna add them to the specification or not. Uh, don't, we've always tried to be very careful about not doing things that are tool specific because this is meant to be an open language and available for everybody to use. Uh, the asset diagram itself, uh, here you can see this is the physical diagram. So this is our physical model. The, the rectangles are simply the assets. The lines connecting them are conduits, okay? And they can be represented uh, in different ways. 
uh, if you want to have a line, special line type like a lightning bolt or ones and zeros or something like that, dashed lines, you can do anything you want to, to pretty this up. Uh, and of course, you could use pictures instead of the blocks. There's no reason not to, to allow that. So these are, this, again, if you want just a simple boxes and lines diagram, that's fine. But if you want to turn it into a pretty picture, there's nothing wrong with doing that too, as long as it has that semantic meaning to it that captures the information you're looking for. The last but not least of the of the of these primary ones that we say are mandatory to have is a traceability diagram. And we like the spider diagram a lot for that. What this is showing me is the different entities that are in the database and how they're connected to other things in the database, other entities in the database. So if you see, I, I can I can click on uh, this particular risk and see the, the, the attributes associated with it here. Uh, but you see those relationships between them. So again, this is a kind of nice way to see how things are connected to each other. And this could get very big, by the way. These diagrams sometimes could blow up to be huge. Um, so um, it, is, it is a challenge to uh, make sure that you can adjust these to be just what you want to see and how you want to see it. So LML itself is basically a foundation for uh, tools to support systems engineering and program management, actually. Uh, it's both as technical and programmatic classes that needed across the life cycle. Uh, again, it defines the action diagram. It, it, we think is a much better way to show logic and the functional requirements, uh, helping you develop your functional requirements. Um, again, the physical diagrams uh, provides for abstraction, instances, cloning, so you can have duplicates of it. So the same functionality can be uh, operating under uh, duplicates of uh, those different objects. Uh, those are all concepts that are in the specification. And then last but not least, LML is meant to be the 80% solution for your ontology. It's not the be all and end all. It's a good starting point. Feel free to add what you need to it. It's it, That's perfectly acceptable. Uh, and like I say, we've extended it in InnoSlate significantly. Um, so one of the things that keeps coming up, and there's there's quite a bit of myth out there that somehow Spec Innovations owns LML. That is absolutely not true. <laughs> it is an open standard. It was developed by a committee. Uh, the committee is chaired. Uh, from the from the beginning, uh, by a professor from the Naval Postgraduate School, Dr. Warren Bannerman. Uh, he's also a retired Navy captain. So again, <laughs> not not ours. Uh, this is this is everybody's. It's completely open and available. If you go to lifecyclemodeling.org, you can get all the information about it, see the different people, and apply for membership uh, as well. So we're always looking for more people to join it. Uh, my role on on the committee has been the secretary. So that's been mostly what I've done is take notes and uh, and work with with everybody on on it. So we're actually very very proud of this product. Uh, and LML to us is the important thing. Um, the implementation of it, of course, at some point somebody had to implement it. We certainly talked to a number of tool vendors and suggested it to them. They could have easily added it. Um, they deferred, and so we started building InnoSlate. And uh, we decided that was a great platform to test and enhance the language. And it has been. It's given us a, a lot of ideas, uh, particularly extending it into the verification validation uh, domain. Uh, we've done that with our test center and uh, things like that as, as well in it. Um, but other tools can use this as an open standard. Uh, I prototyped it in the Vitek Core tool. Uh, Cradle can use it. Um, almost anybody can use the ontology part of it very easily. The only thing you're going to run into is the action diagram problem. Uh, but that's that's okay. You can kind of work around that if you need to. Um, and the key is that it's easy to map to other ontologies. We've had no problem tying it to other, these other things. And in fact, in the specification itself, uh, the, the latest version, which was 1.1, that actually included the direct tie to SysML, and the 1.0 had already tied it back to the DoDAP meta model 2.0. So, so this this ability to trace back to those things is very very easy. Um, <clears throat> 
So um, I, I can go into it and show you what we've done with the implementation more in the tool. Um, and um, uh, but, but otherwise, let, why don't we open it up for questions first and uh, see if there's any specific things and make sure we have plenty of time for questions. Thanks, Dr. Dam. Uh, we've already received a few questions. If you haven't done so, please send your questions to the panel on the right. Feel free to ask us any questions if you have any. Uh, Dr. Dam will answer as many questions as you can before our time is up. Our first question is, as an MBSE tool user uh, of any tool, why do I need to know about LML? Uh, can I just use the diagrams and models? So with InnoSlate, we've done our best to kind of almost hide that uh, part of it. So you, you don't have to be an expert at LML. Um, in fact, that, that probably is worthwhile for me to spend a second here and, and show um, the tool. So this is actually, by the way, we, we do our own process. We eat our own dog food. We're actually using this to do all kinds of things. So let me go to one of my more general uh, projects here for this purpose. And of course, on the cloud, you are signed out. So, so the the uh, if I go to look at one of my diagrams, for example, like the action diagram here. For the most part, I don't need to know that that's an action, but it does help as I'm looking at other relationships and things like that associated with it, the perform by relationships here, for example, um, uh, you know, that making sure I'm doing the things that make sense, uh, attributes that are associated with it as well. So again, I think it, it helps you in using it more effectively, but in general, the tool itself tries to take care of you as much as possible. Um, but having that open structure allows you then to expand it, to grow it, uh, to understand more, create more depth with it. So that's that's why I think it's valuable. And again, we've tried to make that as easy as possible. So in our database view, you can set this up to, to make it so that you can see specific things you wanna see, like create a risk register. So here's my risks. And as I scroll down here, I see my mitigation techniques. And so that's that's a nice way to be able to view the information. Uh, knowing that relationship between the two is actually very helpful. Thank you. Um, a follow-up to that last question, using that model, how would it look different in SysML? So in SysML, we actually again mapped to SysML and create all those diagrams. So you take a look at the action diagram here. Uh, because we were able to map the ontology to the SysML diagramming frameworks, we can come down here and select the activity diagram and then see the equivalent in SysML. And so this, again, it's just some different shapes. There's some, some symbologies that are involved in this, but fundamentally it's the same information content. Uh, and in, for us, it particularly is because this diamond isn't just a construct, this isn't just a, a diamond, it is actually still that action. And so I know what it is. Uh, um, I will say I just find this a little harder to understand and use. And, and I must say that also that uh, many of the tools will really busy up these diagrams. So there's a lot of what I call visual clutter, which again makes it harder for users to come on up to speed on the tool and use it effectively. So I think that's a lot of the problems I've seen in the past with it. Um, but you know, it's it's fine. If I could if I could solve all the world's problems with nine diagrams, I'd feel pretty good. I just know I can't do that. <laughs> Our next question is: How is SysML not enough for the systems engineering community? I'm sorry. How is what? How is SysML not enough for the systems engineering community? Well, uh, because I think it's missing a lot of things. Uh, first of all, uh, SysML doesn't specify simulation. Uh, so discrete event Monte Carlo simulation is important, continuous simulation, a lot of other simulation types to do that verification. Uh, they don't have concepts like test center, where we're doing our test analysis, our test work, right? Uh, um, they don't have um, risk diagrams risk matrices, risk burndown charts aren't part of SysML. So 
So there's so many things we do. Cost is, it can be put in, but these things, you're basically, as somebody explained it to me, in with SysML, what I'm doing is I'm creating an ontology on the fly. And what we try to do is take that load off you and give you a base ontology to work in. So it gives you, it's sort of like playing tennis. You know, it's a tough game to play without a net to know how you score, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, so so without net, the net and lines, it isn't as much fun really as a game. Um, you need you need some boundaries to help you keep things from becoming so open that nobody can understand it. The other thing that, that I've seen with SysML that's been a big problem is when somebody draws a diagram, about the only person who really understands it fully is the person who drew it, and maybe not even them. <laughs> so it's uh, it's 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 really a problem. <laughs> Hope that answered the question. Our next question is, how would you suggest starting the impl implementation process of the lifecycle modeling language in an organization? Yeah, that is that is always a challenge. Uh, one of the things is, of course, it's, it's a lot of it's just education, uh, just getting people familiar with the, the idea of starting simple. Um, one of the nice things is we provide a lot of resources for you. Uh, there's a very simple book here. Uh, this is actually a stack of the books here. It's actually a very thin paperback. It's $15 on Amazon on Essential LML. And that's all you really need to get started. Uh, that helps a lot. Uh, but like any other thing, when you're bringing in something new, you need, you need it's part of business process reengineering. You need to go uh, back to uh, the original, uh, uh, you know, top level people and say, hey, you know, some of these change things have to come top down. And so that's always, that's always an important part of it as well. And our next question is, which SysML version considering 2.0 is in beta and has new objects? Um, so we're using the older version because so, until the 2.0 standard is formalized and out, it's kind of, you're, 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 you've got a moving target. <laughs> so we'd, we'd rather wait until that's actually out. Um, I don't really care <laughs> what they end up doing, to be honest. Again, I, I think I could, we can map to whatever they're doing. So if we have to add some more diagram types and things like that to support it, I'm fine with that not a big deal we have we have 25 different diagram types and counting in InnoSlate, two chart types uh, so it's there's there's a lot uh, that we already have and we have stuff that I, usually you just think of in um, um, show you a couple of interesting examples it's, this is the kind of things you would just draw in PowerPoint so things like the uh, layer diagram my favorites. So this is a uh, is this now? so this is a um, diagram which is actually showing a hierarchy, and each of these different blocks you can see by the numbering scheme is showing you different levels. Okay, and so this is sometimes people like to see it this way um, to see the information and see how things are connected to each other too. You could do that with this. Uh, this is literally just a hierarchy, though. If you go to the hierarchy chart version of this, there it is. So, you know, it's it's just another way to view the information. And that's all diagrams are, are ways to view information. And we make it as interactive as possible, so you don't have to get, it doesn't have to be hard. Thank you. Um, our next question is, how does one join the LML steering committee? Oh, okay. Um, so I think that the way we currently are doing it uh, is that there is just an email to the committee. Uh, and I think that's in, let me just go to that website. I should have that up. Or, okay. I do go there often. <laughs> uh, so, and there is actually an application form now. I forgot we have that on now on the website. The website's new, so I'm still familiarizing myself with it. Uh, so that is another thing that is happening. Um, and uh, so you're welcome to do that. And uh, 
makes it very easy. Thank you. That is going to conclude the question and answer portion of the webinar. We would like to thank you again for joining us for today's webinar. Make sure to join us next time for our next webinar, InnoSlate 101, a webinar for new users on January 7th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. As always, we will also send the recording and slide deck to everyone that attended today. We would also like to make a quick announcement that we are sponsoring the Model-Based Systems Engineering Conference and the registration is now open. MBS CECON will take place virtually on February 22nd through the 24th of 2021 and will focus on MBSC through experienced invited speakers and panelists, workshops, and paper presentations. To learn more about MBS CECON, please visit mbscon.haysummit.com. For more research resources, we encourage you to visit our website and our blog, as well as connect with us on social media through the InnoSlate user group or through Twitter using the handle at InnoSlate. That concludes today's presentation. Thank you again for your attendance, and we hope to see you again at our next webinar. Please enjoy the rest of your day.